Let's bow our heads. Loving Father, we truly thankful for your great love and kindness towards us. Thank you so much, Father, for this privilege. We still have religious liberty and we are truly thankful. Please, Lord, may you bless us as we open up your word. Please, may you do what my feeble efforts could never do. Impress upon our hearts and minds, including my own heart and mind, the necessity to step fast. Help us to see that indeed time is almost finished. Abide with us now, Father, for we ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Blessed Sabbath, church. Blessed Sabbath. Amen. Amen. Blessed Sabbath. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to continue with our study we had started, I think, two weeks back. We're going to continue. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, as I was looking, do you know there's a field, a field of study, actually that is called collapsology. Collapsology, have you ever heard of that? Some of us, the first time ever hearing something called collapsology. It's people that study into the collapse of society. That, that is actually, the, the collapsology is people that specifically zoom in and they look at collapse, whether it's nations, with every field, economic, they look at every aspect. And collapsology specifically speak about the collapse that's about to take place. I wonder if their predictions is in harmony with inspiration. Very interesting. And I want us to look now, let me just show us very briefly before we actually get into the study. This from Los Angeles Times, it says collapsologists those who study into the collapse of stuff. Collapsologists are warning humanity that business as usual will make the earth uninhabitable. Now, we're gonna go into this, we're gonna speak further, but they are saying that things cannot continue as normal. Now, it's interesting, because collapsologists are giving us a specific date in which they say, Everything collapsed at this, is this point, if there's no change. Now, publicly speaking, does the Bible speak of the collapse? Does the Bible, is there, is there a biblical thing? Does the Bible teach there's going to be a collapse in every aspect in Babylon? Yes. Revelation 18, that angel that comes down, when he comes down, he says that Babylon has fallen, Babylon has collapsed. And he repeats that Babylon has collapsed, Babylon has fallen. And Babylon constitutes the papal system, America, apostate Protestantism, and the kings of the world, and nations of the world, and, and obviously spiritualism. So the Bible does predict there's going to be a collapse. It does predict there's going to be a collapse. Now, before we look at that and we go further, before we look at that, we're gonna pause and pray and, and introduce our study. I'm gonna draw our mind to this quotation, one from Selected Messages, and in other ones from last day events. I want us to read these quotations, and I want you to see biblically, spiritual prophecy, when does the spiritual prophecy say that we are to see America collapse? We want to see when does she say America will collapse? Now, she's not going to use the word collapse, she's going to use the word ruin. Now, when something's ruined, is it still functioning? You know when something, whatever object you have at home, whether it's your washing machine, your whatever, when that thing's ruined, it has collapsed. It is no more operating, it's doomed, it's no more working. So she's gonna tell us an event that shows that when we see this event, that America is on the verge of collapse, of ruin. I want you to see what the prophet says. And then we want to go to the collapsologist and see what date are they saying America will collapse by. And then we want to look at the event the prophet says precedes the collapse of America and see, are we seeing that event? This is what we want to do. Now, this is from Selected Messages, book two, page 373. Let's see what the prophet says. Father, please bless these words for I have opened them in Jesus' name, amen. She says, it is a time, it is at the time 
of national apostasy. So let's pause there. What is she referring to here? National what? Apostasy. Now, what is national? The word national. It's, it's that country, right? It's that national, that country, international, it's global. So she says, yeah, it is at the time of national apostasy. Now, when she says national, remember we refer to the national Sunday law. Now, what brings about the national Sunday law? I'm saying which nation brings about the Sunday law? America. So we call it national Sunday law because it's specifically in reference to America. America starts it as a national Sunday law, then it becomes a USL. What is USL? Universal Sunday law. Now, let's see what she says. Now, what we want to look at, let us, we want to look at specifically the collapse. We want to look at the collapse of America. Does the prophet speak, the Bible and the prophet speak of America collapsing? And then we want to go to the thinking men and women. Do, and are they going to give, the, actually I'm going to tell you that the thinking men and women, people that have studied the rise and fall of empires, they have their whole life they have studied this, not one man, many men. And they're going to tell us, based on what they have studied, that America has an expiry date. You know what's an expiry date? Thus far and no further. Friends, we are on a verge. This thing is ending. This thing is ending. Wherever we look, it's all pointing to one thing, that this world cannot continue much longer. Friends, at this stage of Earth's history, it's too late to play with sin. It is too late. Wanna study into the collapse Now we're going to look at the collapse of the United States of America. But question, I'm asking a question now. Is America the only nation that collapse, collapses? Revelation 18 says that Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And then it says in verse 3 that all nations have drunk of the wine of her wrath. So questions, how much of the nations become a part of Babylon? It says all nations because they're going to participate with the false doctrines of Babylon. So if Babylon falls, which obviously is the Roman Catholic Church and apostate Protestants America, how many nations would fall with Babylon? Every nation is going to fall. Every nation is going to collapse. But which nation you think must collapse first? America. 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 Now... I want us to look at this. I want us to look at this. Now let us look at this. It says here, Selected Messages, Book 2, 373. She says, it is, at a, it is at the time of national apostasy. So now she uses a word. We want to put this word down. She uses the word national apostasy. So let's put it here. National apostasy. Now I want you to see what does she say national apostasy leads to. It's going to lead to something. Let's see what she says. And what is the question also, what is national apostasy? What is she referring to? Now, in context, she's referring to America. Now, let's see what it says here. It says, it is at the time of national apostasy when acting on the policy of Satan. So this national apostasy that comes to America, it's going to be driven by who? Satan. It says, the rulers of the land will rank themselves on the side of the man of sin. Now think now, think. The rulers of the land of America are going to rank themselves on the side of the man of sin. Now what is the man of sin? Well, his very name, man of sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. So what brings national apostasy? It's when America propagates or pushes the teachings of the man of sin. And what teachings does he have? Transgression of the law. What law will America enforce? Sunday, Sunday law. Is that transgression of law? Yes. yes, transgression of law. So what I'm seeing, what we can see is that national apostasy, when America enforces the national Sunday law. This is in harmony with the man of sin. She says, it is a time, or it is at the time of the national apostasy, when acting on the policy of Satan, the rulers of the land will rank themselves on the side of the man of sin. 
it is then that the measure of guilt is full. So when America passes a Sunday law, what does she say concerning their guilt? It's, full. it's now full. It has reached the limit. It has reached the limit. Then she says, the national apostasy is the signal for national ruin. So what does national apostasy give way to? What does she say? National ruin. National ruin. Now friends, give me another word. Another, when something is ruined, what will you say it is? It has now collapsed. It has collapsed. It has collapsed. So what we can see, what leads to the collapse of America? Based on the quotation, what, what leads to its collapse? When it enforces a Sunday law, America now is on the verge of collapse. On the verge of collapse. National ruin would lead to national apostasy. Next quotation. Lost events 134. She says when the state, America, will use its power. Now, I want you to see this now. This quotation, she's going to give us, yes, it's the Sunday law. But the thing, yes, national Sunday law is national apostasy. But she's going to give us now... I would say the thing that gives birth to the Sunday law, which leads to national ruin. I don't know if you're following what I'm saying. Amen, brother. Let's see. Let's see. She says, when the state shall use its power to enforce the decrees and sustain the institutions of the church. So, so what you're saying that when the state uses its power to enforce the decrees of the, of the church, what does she say? Then will Protestant America have formed the image to the papacy, and there will be national apostasy, which will end in national ruin. So friends, I wanna ask a question. If America is about to collapse, what must we see? If America is, yes, a Sunday law, but based on this quotation, we must see the church and the state uniting if America is on the verge of collapse. You say, why do I say that? Because church and state first unite. And as they unite in, they give birth to what? As the church influences the state, like when a man and a woman come together, they give birth to a, a child is born. And inspiration calls the National Sunday Law, she calls it the child of the papacy. So in order for this child to be born, you need the woman, which is the church, and you need a state, which obviously represents the man who takes the place of Jesus because Jesus is the, he is the man. He's, he, he's the husband and the church is the, the bride. So in order for this child to be born, church and state must unite within America. If America is about to collapse, so you follow what I'm saying, friends? So let's put here church plus state. This will be, a will give birth to B, National Sunday Law. National Sunday Law is what? National apostasy, which gives way to national ruin. Or another word is collapse. Collapse. So we're following, friends. Is this simple? This is, this is to me, it's simple. Now, another quotation on this point. One more quotation on this point. Now, I want to ask, when a nation's probation is closed, what does God do? Then commences judgment. Whenever a nation's probation is closed, when the children of Israel, when God could do nothing more for them, it says there was no more remedy. What did God then do? He sent Babylon, king of the north, came and destroyed the children of Israel. Whenever a nation's iniquity is full and God can do no nothing else, then commences judgment. Now I want you to see what she says here. Volume 5, 451. She says, by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy, in violation of the law of God. Our nation, now who is, when she says our nation, who is she referring to? America. She says by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy, what decree is she referring to that America will enforce that's going to honor the papacy? Sunday law. She says by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy, in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When does America disconnect herself fully from righteousness? At the National Sunday Law. The National Sunday Law. And then she says, when we see that, she says, 
Then, read words, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous workings of Satan and that the end is near. So when we see America passing the Tandalo, she says, you know that the end is near. Now, I want us to look at this. Let us look at this. Let us look at this. Now, this is the scientist. Now, I want you to see what the scientists are telling us. It says, scientists warn humanity in denial of looming collapse of civilization as we know it. So scientists are telling us that humanity cannot continue much longer. That every field is telling us, the scientists are looking and they're saying, this world cannot continue much longer. Now it's interesting, do you know how the Bible describes the world? Oh brother, Gibson. The Bible describes the world in a bottomless pit. That, that's Revelation 20. Now that word bottomless pit is the same word that is used in the, um, in the Septuagint. That same word bottomless pit, abusos, is used in the Septuagint. Now the Septuagint is the Greek of the old Bible. Now the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, New Testament is written in Greek, but Septu Septuagint, whole Bible is written in Greek. The, that word bottomless pit, abyss, is found in Genesis chapter one, verse two, when it describes the earth without form or void. That, that's, that's actually the word, abusos, the earth being in a state of without form and void. So question, as we are coming to the end, are we to see the earth becoming better and better, or is the earth to come to a state of deteriorating? Does the Bible say the earth will wax old as a garment? So as we are nearing the end, we are to see that everything in society collapsing, everything collapsing. So the scientists are telling us that civilization as we know it is coming to an end. It's gonna collapse. Now, what year do they say human extinction? Now, watch it. Now, this is not, these are not scholars. These are people that are studying into collapsologists. They study every field and they say that extinction, now question, does the Bible teach of human extinction? I'm asking, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was asked the signs that will precede his coming. And then he says in verse 22, he says that except those days are shortened, no flesh will be saved alive. Jesus predicts extinction and he says, I'm not going to allow the planet to reach extinction. Before it reaches extinction, I'm going to cut it short. Now in education, we are told that present, the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men, she says they all have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Who, she says, no, not scholars, she says thinking men, thinking men. So based on the thinking men, they say extinction, which is a biblical thing, Extinction, they say in around 2026. This is the thinking man. Now, I want you to see this. The average, now, this here came out, when, when was this? When did it come out? January 13, 2022. It says, now, our eyes are specifically on America. It says, the average, the average empire survives. Now, we're going to show you the thinking men and women, thinking men who have studied collapsology, specifically nations rise and fall. It says the average empire survives for 250 years. Question, is America a dead store? Now, I want you to follow, beloved. America dies, America, you say, what do you mean America dies? It collapses after it passes a national Sunday law. Dead knocks on the door of America when she passes the Sunday law. Why? She disconnects herself fully from righteousness. Now, I want you to think, if, how, how, how long are the collapsologists, those who study the rise and fall of nations say that a nation rules for approximately, this is, this is what they're saying. They're saying it, 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 it governs for 250 years and it collapses. Now, the man gives facts of the facts of the facts and he shows nation after nation after nation. It took approximately 250 years before they collapsed. 
Now, I want you to see this now. My question is, if this is true, which we, it's fact will show you, but watch here that America declares independence as a nation. Watch here. Watch here. This is from their own web. This is their own, America's own page. It says here, the declaration of independence in watch here. Now let's do this. So 250 years, a nation governs for it and it collapses. So let's put here 1776. What do we come to? 2026. Oh, brother. It comes to 2026. The collapsologists say America falls 2026. This is what they're telling us. It says, this is Fox News, America's expiration date will the US collapse in 2026. Friends, the facts is all there. We just need to pick it up and read it. Everyone who studies into the collapse of nations are all pointing to one date, America falls in 2026. Now, I want you to think with me. I want you to think, if this is true, where would you put 2026? I'm saying, if the thinking man, now, this is their date, it's not my date. They say in America falls by 2026. Where would you put 2026 on this chart? You can't be, brother. Because America only collapses after. Wait, mother. Wait, mother. Look at the chart. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not teaching good then. I'm not teaching good. But, but, <laughs> wait. Okay, I'm going to take a hand. Brother, give him the mic. Do you have the mic, brother? They want the mic to be passed to people. Yes, yes, yes. So, brother, okay. So, what I'm saying, thanks, thanks for the answers, but thank you. Thank you. So, what I've heard so far, that America will collapse where? At the Sunday law. I'm saying that can't be. Brother, you're gonna have to try. It says that our nation will fully disconnect ourselves from righteousness. That's at the passing of the national Sunday law. So once the Sunday law is passed, then the collapse of the nation. Amen. Remember what she says, that national apostasy will lead to national ruin. And what does ruin? Collapse. So where would you place? So let someone say, oh, I've got 2026 at least. 2026 is not Sunday law. 2026 is the complete rune, national rune. So where would you place 2026? National rune. This is where it comes. Now friends, national rune, collapse comes off the Sunday law. I don't know if you're following what I'm saying. When America, I'm saying, what they saying that America collapses in 2026, that's not Sunday law. That's that it's only a result of Sunday law. So if America collapses in 2026, meaning that she already passed the Sunday law some date before 2026. Are we following friends? Now in the school of the prophets, we studied that the church as fourth generation ends, watch here, speak to me, 2024. So I want to, I wonder if we're gonna see a crosshead. I wonder if the collapse or where, our collapse, I'm saying as a church, where our limit comes is at the same time of America's limit or America passing a Sunday law. Yes. I wonder. I wonder. Now, let's look at this. Let's look at this. Let, let, let us see what it's saying. Let us see what it's saying. It says there, second paragraph, it says that the book now, there's a book published that specifically studies into the rise and falls of nations. And it got the attention of Fox News because the accuracy within that book, and specifically pointing to America, showing that America falls, 2026. Now it says here, yeah, now I wonder, when America collapses, when America passes a Sunday law, how many nations follow suit? Every nation on the globe. Volume 6, page 18. Every nation on the globe follows America. So if America passes a Sunday law and that's a sign of her ruin, her collapse, every nation passes a Sunday law soon after America, what does that indicate about every nation? Every nation's about to collapse. And watch here are those who are looking into this saying that human extinction, 2026. It says the book, this book inspired by the late British diplomat Sir John Glubb, who, who found a pattern to the decline of nations. 
He said that the pattern has not changed in the 4,000 years of history he studied. So for 4,000 years, you can check it out, friends. We've got no time to look at every, every nation. But for 4,000 years, he showed that the nation, whenever a nation becomes supreme, it takes approximately 250 years and the nation declines. It continues, it says, and this caught the attention of Fox News and many other places that caught their attention. And they said, we want to know more about this thing. It says, he said that the pattern has not changed in the 4,000 years of history he studied and that the average age of great nations is how long? 250. It continues, it says, Sir John calculated that the average age of empires and superpowers is 250 years. And on July 4th, 2026, the United States will be 250 years old. We have been living of the, yes, of past generations. Ronald Reagan used to say, we are only one generation away from losing it all. Nations like library books must be renewed by each generation and sometimes within a generation if they are to survive or exist beyond mere shelves of their former selves. Like the United Kingdom, which, no more, which is no more united, much less still a kingdom in its historic sense. So what the man is simply saying, that from his looking for over 4,000 years, he traced the history for 4,000 years, and he saw that 150 years, a nation must collapse when it comes to that time. And he's, sorry, 250. And he's saying that on July 4, 2026, America would have reached 250 years of existence and now expires, now expires. Now, beloved, before we pause and pray, my question is this, my question is this, if America is gonna collapse plus minus, now, I'm gonna put, they give definite time. I'm gonna say plus minus, 2026. <laughs> We're not gonna give a day, these men studied into this thing, so they've given us definite time. America falls 2026. Now, if that is true, I wanna ask a question. If it's true, come with me to Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13. Now, remember what she says in Great Controversy 370, 371, that one sign of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Though no man knows the day nor the hour, we are required and expected to know when it is near. So even though we cannot know exact day and hour, heaven requires us to know when it is near. The thinking men are giving us this date. And she says to disregard this warning will be as deadly to us as it was for those in the days of Noah, not to know a flood was coming. Revelation chapter 13, Revelation 13. So what leads to national apostasy is when America passes a Sunday law. That is national apostasy, which leads to national ruin, which is collapse. And the thinking men are saying 2026, America collapses. Now let's go to the Bible and see what precedes the Sunday law. What precedes the Sunday law? Revelation 13 verse 15. What will America do? It says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. What precedes the enforcement of a Sunday law and a death penalty? Based on what we've just read, what precedes the Sunday law? The mark of the beast. That is it, brother. The formation of, the, 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 as the Bible says, the image of the beast will be formed. When the image is formed, there's a death penalty. The mark of the beast is enforced. So what precedes the enforcement of the National Sunday Law, the mark of the beast, is the formation of the image of the beast. So if America is going to collapse plus minus 2026, then at least we should see, now we should see the union of church and state.
One more, could the US collapse in the next five years? They all come into one date. What date are they looking at? 2026. 2026. Now, I wonder if we see in the formation of the image of the beast. I showed you this. Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, ending 50, 50 years of federal abortion rights. Now, friends, does it have a date here? 2022. Now, someone says, what does Roe versus Wade have anything to do with a national Sunday law church and state national apostasy, which is going to lead to national ruin? What does this have to do with anything? Friends, you know, in 2022, when this law was passed, in 2022, overturning Roe versus Wade, that it meant something. It meant something. What did it mean? Roe versus Wade has been overturned. Now, does it, do you know what's Roe versus Wade? What, what is it? Abortion. Uh, the, the, the abortion rights. So it was overturned in 2022. It says Roe versus Wade has been overturned. What does this mean for America? So this is the question, what does it mean for America? Let's see what caused Roe versus Wade to be overturned. Roe versus Wade challenges, meaning it's been overturned, challenges separation of church and state. What caused it to be overturned at abortion? No, it's no more right. There was church influence in the state that caused Roe versus Wade to be overturned. Union of church and state. Again, overturning Roe versus Wade blurs church and state. Again, off the matter of Roe versus Wade, separation of church and state is even more important now. So, in a couple of months ago, this thing was overturned. What caused it to be overturned? Union of church and state. Union of church and state. Friends, are we seeing the formation of the image? This is the formation of the image. Now, because that was overturned, we shared this that people looked at that and said that if we press the Supreme Court a little bit more, they might enforce something else for us because the Supreme Court overturned that. Remember we showed you this? West Virginia Attorney General urges Supreme Court to protect Sabbath in case. So what are they urging the Supreme Court now to protect? The Sabbath. The Sabbath. Yeah, it's the false Sabbath. The false Sabbath. Again, West Virginia urges Supreme Court to protect Holy Sunday. Again, opinion, how now is a good time to create a regular day of rest? When was this year? When was this? November 21st, 2022. A Texas, this is December 1st, 2022. A Texas newspaper reported that Sunday is the Lord's day and should be used for rest and worship. Because so doing, because doing is so essential, it's not optional. So there's a strong push now for the enforcement of Sunday. Question, where are we in 2022? Where are we in 2022? Church and state. Church and state. What are they now pushing for? What is the church trying to get the Supreme Court to do? Enforce a Sunday law. Enforce a Sunday law. So if the collapse takes place in 2026, we are to see prior to 2026, America enforcing the Sunday law. Are we on the verge of that? Friends, we can hear the rumbling. It's indicating we're almost there. And what does the Sunday law do? Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 976. That thing closes our probation. When America enforces the Sunday law, then it's too late to prepare. Too late. Too late to prepare. I'm going to stop here. Let us pause. Let us pray. And then we can get into our short study. Let us reverently kneel. Let us kneel. Loving Father, Lord, we are humbly pleading for your spirit now as we seek to understand 
a special work of preparation that must take place before this crisis breaks upon this world. Please may your spirit guide us. Please may impress upon heart and mind the importance of what we are about to study. And by your grace, Lord, I just pray that whatever we learn, whatever you teach us, may some truth speak to our hearts directly. May you reveal exactly our duty and may you give us the strength to do as you say. Please, may you bless us now for and abide with us for we ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to start our study. We're going to be looking at true education. I want to start with a quotation we're very familiar with in Mind, Character, and Personality, Book 1, page 53. The prophet says, now as never before, we need to understand the science of true education. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. So she says that if we're going to enter into God's kingdom, we need to understand what? What do we need to? The science of true education. This is what we need to understand is the science of true education. Someone says, does this have anything to do with preparation? Oh, yes, friends. Yes, it does. So we want to look at this issue of true education. But we're going to go back where we stopped and continue. Now, what is, what is education from what we've been studying? What is education? What is the simple definition of education? To restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to perfection in which he was originally created. So would you agree with me that true education has to do with character? Yes. What, what kind of characters it's trying to develop true education? What kind of characters? Christ-like. I mean Christ-like characters. That is true. Christ-like characters, but yes, Christ-like characters. But what does the quotation say? That is true. That perfect, perfect characters. So it's trying to develop perfect, true education inculcates perfect education. So in any education that comes to us, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it has the title, true education or higher education, and it has nothing to do in bringing me back to perfection, what education is that? It is a false education. We cannot embrace it. It is false. So, true education, without it, no heaven. No heaven at all. And what is the purpose of true education? To restore the image of God in man. To bring man back to perfection in which he was created. Now, we agreed that education has much to do with character perfection. Now, I want to see from the very book, Education, what does the prophet say? Which institution I want, I want us to read from the prophet, from the very book called in Education. Which institution that heaven has given us, out of honor, God has given many institutions, but which institution that heaven has given us as, has greater influence in the development of Christian character, perfect characters? <laughs> Amen. Let, let us see what the prophet says in the book Education. Let us see what she says. So I'm going to the chapter called Cooperation, chapter 33. Cooperation. I'm reading from the very first sentence from that chapter. Yes, the first sentence, page 283. She says, in the formation of character. Now remember, true education is to do what? Help us develop what kind of characters? Perfect characters. So she's talking about the development of character. The development of character. Listen to what she says. In the formation of character, no other influences count so much as the influence of the home. So I want you to reason with me. If Satan wants to hinder the work of character development, which institution, which institution heaven has given to mankind will he wage war against? That he'll make sure that we are ignorant on how to conduct the home. The home. 
out of every institution, this institution is gonna be a special attack, why? Because this institution specifically develops character. Th this is what she's saying. She says, in the formation of character, no other influence can count so much as the influence of the home. Is there anything more powerful than the home, based on what I'm reading, mm -mm. In, the, in, in, in the formation of Christian character? Now, this institution Satan's afraid of, he trembles. Like, you know, Satan is not really, in, many institutions, you know, every institution that can be developed, do you know that if the home was not right, that institution would be a failure? You say, what do I mean? Do you know that even a church, a church would be a failure if the homes are not right? What is the condition for someone to have leadership within the church? Their home. That's what the Bible says, that if a man cannot rule his own home, he is unfit to govern the church. The success of the church depends upon the home. Every institution, let me say this, if the home is corrupt, whether there's a school, whether there's a sanitarium, you name that institution, that institution would collapse and fall. Because in every institution, you know what you have in every institution, even in a church, there's one thing you have in every institution, whether it's a school, whether it's a sanitarium, whatever, you name it. Even a church, every institution has families. Every institution. And if Satan wants to shut down every institution, instead of shooting his bullets at every institution, all he needs to do is just shoot his bullet at the home. Because if the home collapses, everything collapses. Everything collapses. But now, we are talking about true education, character development, the prophet points us to the home. This is where the prophet points us to, the home. Now my question is, inside the home, inside the home, what specifically, what specifically would Satan want to interfere with? Amen. What is that, brother? Okay, the powerful, powerful, powerful. That is true, that is true, that is true. Now, there's a quotation in the book Adventist Home. I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna find it now. But she says, actually, in Steps to Christ, there's a quotation in Steps to Christ, she says that God seeks to reveal himself to the human family, she says, through the closest earthly ties. So through relationships, and she says, the closest earthly ties he seeks to reveal himself. So what is she saying? It is that through relationships within the family, God desires to reveal his character. That's what he desires to do. But which is the closest earthly tie? Could someone find it for me in the book Adventist Home? The mother and the child. Amen. Amen. What page is that, sister? <laughs> Brother, you're not, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. There's a quotation where she says the closest earthly tie, the closest earthly tie in the book Adventist Home. If it's not Adventist Home Child Guidance, but I think it's Adventist Home. The closest earthly tie. She specifically mentions which relationship it is. Um, Adventist Home, page 18, What does it say, sister? The family tie is the closest, the most tender and sick of God's mother. Okay, but there, there, there's a quotation. We'll find it after we'll find it, if we cannot find it now. Now, I'm reading from the book Education. I'm going to the chapter, it's called Preparation. I, b I believe it's page 275. Education. It's about the song, page 240. 200 and? 240. 240, what does it say, brother? It says, like what? Yes, yes. It says, like mother, like children. The tenderest earthly tie is that between the mother and her child. Mm. The child is more readily impressed by the life and example of the mother than by that of the father, mm. for a stronger and more tender bond of union unites them. Amen. So what is the closest earthly tie within the human family? Mother and child. Mother and child. And God seeks to reveal himself to the closest earthly ties. So God even seeks to reveal himself in that relationship. Someone says, how would God seek to do that? Friends, 
that relationship between the mother and child, won't you say that the mother reveals in some degree the love of God to the child? The child question, it says that God loved us before we loved him. Question, if my, I'm just saying, if the parent should die, that baby, that child, how much would that affect that baby or that child? I'm saying in, in, in that state, how much would it affect that child, that baby? It wouldn't affect the child one, but that mother is gone. So he has a love that mother gives, and at that age, as a baby, that child cannot render love back. And you know, someone says, but isn't it God, it's getting love? No, no. When you talk about God's love, it's God giving love. That, that, that was, that, that's obviously love, love is return, but mainly God gives the love. God gives the love. So in that relationship with child and mother, you see actually the relationship between God and us. God constantly imparting his love. And sometimes even in the human family, God gives his love, but there's some people who do not actually acknowledge that love. Remember, God, Jesus says that the Father, he allows the sun to shine both on the wicked and the just. He sends rain on the wicked and the righteous, and some do not acknowledge his gifts. But God still continues to give, constantly giving. So God's love is not just demonstrated. I'm saying in receiving love, yes, true, God gets love back, but mainly God gives love. And we see that with the mother, constantly giving love to the child. Now I want us to see what does the prophet say concerning this issue of education. Let's see what does she say this, on this issue of education. Now listen to this. This is 275. She says the, the child's first teacher is the mother. Now, who is the child's first teacher? Mother. Remember I asked the question two weeks back. When someone wants to become a teacher of children, does the world just take them in or does the world expect a certain standard for them to reach? They must, go and, they must actually get some, some stuff to prove that they can come and teach the children, even though it's false education, the world wants them to get a certain degree of education. But here we see there's a teacher that has been neglected, a teacher that's been neglected, a teacher whose influence is more powerful than even the teachers of the school. She actually goes on to say, she says, during the period of the greatest Amen. And the most rapid development, his education is to a great degree in her hands. To her first is given the opportunity to mold the character for good or for evil. She should understand the value of her opportunity and above every other teacher should be qualified to use it to the best account. So amongst all teachers, which teacher ought to be the best qualified? As the mother. It's the mother. Then she says in the next sentence, yet there is no other to whose training a so little thought is given. The one whose influence in education is most potent and far-reaching is the one whose assistance, whose assistance there is the least systematic effort. So she's saying that the mother in her teaching she says as, as most potent, her teaching is most potent and most far-reaching. But she says there's much neglect with the mother. Now someone says, why, why, why are we studying about this? I want you to see the next page. Jump down in your Bible to, to education to 276. Listen to what she says now in 276. Remember, what is the purpose of education? To restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to perfection. Now listen to what she says concerning education. She says, never will education accomplish all that it might. Now what, is the, what, what, what do we want education? What is the purpose of education? To bring man back to perfection. Never will education accomplish all that it might and should accomplish until so education cannot accomplish all that it can and it will do until something happens. Until the importance of the parent's work is fully recognized and they receive a training for its sacred responsibilities. Question. 
If parents fail, will education accomplish all that it can and will do? It's not going to do it. So if Satan wants education to fail, which is obviously to bring us back to perfection, who do you think he's going to attack? Parents. He's going to make sure that they are ignorant concerning their duties. Now, friends, when I looked at these principles, what I saw is that no Adventist parent should have lost their child to the world. I'm saying looking at these principles. Because the prophet says that should these principles be put into practice, should they be endorsed, should they, should they be received into the heart of parents and put into practice, she says that evil will not attract the child. No evil will attract them. That's the, that, that is a promise from heaven. But thank God that is redemption. That even if parents made mistakes, if they still have influence with their children, there is redemption. There is redemption. Now, come with me in your Bible to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Remember, God promises that before he comes and he smites the earth with a curse, that he has promised to send Elijah. That Elijah will appear before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And I want you to see that Elijah to, uh, to precede the coming of the Lord. What is the work of Elijah to prepare people to meet the Lord? But I want you to see how would Elijah do this work? I want us to see Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, I want us to see verse 6, 17. How will Elijah do this work? It's in reference to John, who was the second Elijah. It says, and he shall go before him, that's before Jesus, in the spirit and the power of Elijah, Elias, to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Now, when Elijah does this, it's actually bringing parents and children together, a work of reform in the home. When this happens, what is Elijah actually doing? It says to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So if Elijah is going to have a people prepared for the Lord, where does Elijah come first? The home. And specifically in light of parents and children. Specifically in light of parents and children. So I want us to look at some principles. We never get to these principles in our last study, but I want us to look at some of these principles. Now, before we look at these principles, let's just remind us, there's a quotation that the prophet speaks about. She mentions, this is from volume six of the testimonies. We shared this last week or two weeks back. She says, those who bear the last message of mercy to the world, their final message, she says, of mercy to the world, should feel it their duty to instruct who? Parents in regard to home religion. The great reformatory movement, that is the loud cry, must begin in presenting to fathers and mothers and children the principles of the law of God. So when the loud cry begins, where must it begin? Within the home. It must begin within the home, friends. It begins within the home. This is where it begins. Now, I want us to look at some principles. What we see based on Jesus, when Jesus speaks of the last days, he says one of the issues that we're going to see in the last days when a crisis breaks up, when a crisis breaks upon the, 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 uh, breaks upon the church, he says that there's going to be families that are actually going to break up when that crisis breaks. And he says that when the crisis breaks, it's going, to be it's going to be revealed when the crisis breaks, unfaithfulness of parents. Why? Because he says when the crisis breaks on, on this world, specifically on the church, it says that children are going to rise up in rebellion against father, against mother. That they are going to be their greatest opponents when they approach to the courts of law. Why? They had failed in their duty. I want you to see this. Come in your Bible to Mark. Mark, actually Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10. And it might be one parent who will be brought to the court of law to answer where the other parent would be lost because they were unfaithful. Do you, see, do you know publicly you see times when children were saved and parents were lost? When parents were saved and children were lost? Publicly you see this. Come with me to Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10, I want us to see Matthew 10 verse 
16, actually verse 18. Jesus is speaking about the signs of the end. He says, and he shall be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Jump down in your Bible now to verse 21. This is when his people are being brought to the courts of law to answer. It says, and the brother shall deliver up brother to death. Now, what is this here? This is the family. A brother delivering up a brother. This is within the home. The father, the child, the children shall rise up against their parents and be cause them to be put to death. Are you seeing what Jesus is saying when the crisis breaks? If, if, fam, if home duties are undone, some of our, our bitterest enemies will be within our own home when the crisis breaks. And if we don't want that, then we, by God's grace, something needs to be done before the crisis within the home. Paul says when he speaks about the last days, one of the greatest things he says is going to happen, he says it's going to be disobedient to parents. He says when you see that, know that we are in the last days. We are in the last days. So we can see that the home is going to, it's going to be a great issue. Now, I want us to see this quotation. Mm, mm, mm. Come back to that one. This is the book Adventist Home 318. Adventist Home, page 318. Listen to what the prophet says, that if you're going to impact the world, if you're going to impact the world, listen to what she says. She says, if religion is to influence society, that's the world. If we want the, our religion, the truths that we have, to influence the world, where must it first influence? It must first influence the home circle. So if God's going to give us success with the world, where must success first come? Within the home. If we have no success with the world, what does that mean we need to re-evaluate re as the home life? That's where we need to re-evaluate the home life. Now, this to me is a beautiful promise in Ministry of Healing 394. Listen to what the prophet says. She says, brought up under the wise and loving guidance of a true home, children will have no desire to wander away in search of pleasure and companionship. So if they grow up in a wise and a loving home, they're not going to wander for companionship. They're not going to want to even leave the home. Listen to what she says. This is interesting. She says, evil will not attract them. That is powerful. That is powerful. That if a child has grown up, as she's saying, in a wise and, in, in a wise and loving home, a true home, evil will not attract their child. Evil will lose its power. This is a promise. The spirit that prevails in the home will mold the characters. They will form habits and principles that will be a strong defense against temptation. And they will leave the home shelter to take their place in the world. Inspiration is saying simple. If, if this can be done right, the principles that God reveals in the book Adventist Home and in the book Child Guidance, if they're adopted, she says the child, evil will not attract the child. That child will receive the seal of God. They will receive the seal. Now, I want us to look at some of these principles very briefly and we'll pause. We're not going to look at all of them. But I want us to introduce some of these principles. Now, one of the things which he says that a mother should do, actually before, before, before we even look at that one, there's one thing she says, let's blank that. There's one thing she says that a parent should teach a child. A father, a mother should teach their child. She actually says the first lesson from babyhood, the child should be taught this. What is that? Amen. Amen. I want us to look at this quotation. Come with, me, come with me to education, those who have the book. I want us to see what she says. In the book, Education, page two, Page 287, education, page 287. Listen to what she says is the first lesson a parent should teach the child. Very first lesson. Actually, she says one of the first lessons. This says education 287. She says one of the first lessons a child needs to learn is the lesson of obedience. What is the first lesson? Obedience. Before he is old enough to reason, he may be taught to obey. 
So when does obedience begin according to inspiration? Even before the child can reason, they must be taught to obey. What is one of the signs of the lost state? Disobedience. So one of the first things she says a child should be taught is obedience. This should be the very, very first lesson. Even if they cannot reason, she says, impress upon their minds, their hearts, that when you speak, they must obey. They must obey. This is the first lesson, obedience. Obedience. Now, hmm. this is from the book Child Guidance, page 79. She's going to refer to a higher education. She says that mothers and fathers and the educators in our schools remember that it is a higher branch of education. So she says this is a higher branch of education. What is a higher branch of education? To teach children obedience. Altogether, too little importance is attached to this line of education. Children will be happier, far happier, under proper discipline than if left to do as their untrained impulses suggest. So she says that obedience is also for the happiness of the child. If you want the child to be happy, teach them obedience. Teach them obedience. So what does she call obedience? A higher form of education. Higher form of education. This is the first lesson. And friends, you know when you read Deuteronomy chapter 6 concerning how you teach the child, Deuteronomy 6 says, how are, you how are you to teach the child obedience? Come with me in your Bible to Deuteronomy 6. Let's see how does the Bible say a parent is to teach the child this lesson. Not only this lesson, but every other lesson. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy, the 6th chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want us to see verse 6. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. It says in Deuteronomy 6, 6, And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. So whatever God commands us, where must it be? In thine heart. And then God says, when it's in your heart, now what means that you are living in accordance with? It says, when it's in your heart, God says, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. What comes first before teaching? You live in it. You can't teach your child obedience if you are living in disobedience to God. If you want the child to be obedient, and even if you are a teacher, a gospel minister, whatever God has called you to serve in, whatever field, a medical missionary, if you live in violation of those principles of health, wherever God has called you, and you try and teach people that thing, you're wasting your time. That is it, brother. The greatest, I'm saying the greatest, do you know why Jesus' words, the Bible, the inspiration says in Ministry of Healing 496 that never man spoke as this man. It says because never man lived as this man. His life was in harmony with his teachings. So if you're going to teach the child obedience, our own hearts, the parents, his own heart must be in obedience to Jesus, must be in submission to Jesus. And friends, it's interesting. You know when you read Deuteronomy 4, why God even entrusts some people with children? It's for their parents' salvation. Yes, it's for the parents' salvation. We could read that in Adventist home. Some parents, some, some people who get married would be lost had, had not a child come there. That's what she says in the book Adventist Home. She says that there would have been self, even Adventist, she says selfishness would grow and strengthen. But in order for God to actually remove the selfishness, he allows a child to come. Uh, that, that is the book Adventist, so we could read that quotation. <laughs> and then she says, brother, there are some, yeah, there, there's also the opposite end, which, which she warns against. So yeah, I, I could read that quotation, but come with me, I want you to see this in Deuteronomy 4. This is what God says. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy 4. I want us to read Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Let us read verse 9. Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. 
It says, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligent enough. Before I continue, let's stop there. Remember we read in 1 Corinthians in the school, we read in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 and 2 that Paul said that he preached the gospel to the Corinthians. He said that they were standing in the gospel. And in the next verse, he says that the gospel will save you if, if condition. Even though they were in it, they were standing in it, they believed that they received it. He says, if you keep it in memory. So based on Paul, yes, we can be in the gospel today, but if the gospel is not kept in memory, can the gospel save us? In order for the gospel to save us, it needs our undivided attention. That's how it saves us, if our minds is constantly dwelling upon it. Now I want you to see what has God developed that the mind constantly dwells upon his teachings. I want you to see what he says in Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4 verse 9. He says, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen. And question, when you forget, what happens? Look what happens when you forget. And lest they depart from thine heart all the days of thy life. Now, I want you to see this. What has God given that you do not forget? But teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. What has heaven given that a, that a person does not forget the, his teachings? Children. If the children are there, what, 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 what will the parents have to constantly do to teach them? And if they're constantly teaching them, what will happen? They will not forget it. It's constantly in the mind, constantly in the heart, because every day they have a duty to teach their child. So this, this is why heaven has given some people children. But let's say this, if a parent is unfaithful, based on inspiration, that that child's blood will be required from the parent's hands. They will not only give an account for their own lives, they will have to give an account for the child. How do we know that? Because when the sealing angel comes, that angel will seal according to the parents. Because a baby, it says that slay utterly old, both young and old, both maids and little children. Why will the children not get the seal? Because of the unfaithfulness of the parents. If the parents is unfaithful, it falls upon the child. But if the parents is faithful, it covers the child, covers the child. Now, what I want us to do, let us see. So what is the first lesson she says that a parent should teach the child? Very first, it's obedience. Obedience, this is the first thing, is obedience. Obedience. Now question, how are they to teach obedience based on Deuteronomy 6? How is a parent to teach their child obedience? By example, there's something greater than precept. What is greater than precept? It's, it's, it's an example. When a child can see that parent loves God, when child can see that the parent is obedient to all what God says, it creates within that child's heart a love for God. They realize that this is not a fantasy, it's not a game, it's a reality. But when they see parents saying one thing and doing something else, do you know that there's no better way if Satan wants to destroy that child loving God, following God, is when they see hypocrisy. Parents saying one thing and then doing something else, the child will reason that this thing is not real. It is not real. So lesson number one is obedience. But I, you cannot truly teach the child obedience unless you yourself is living in obedience to God. You need to live a life of obedience to God. That's lesson number one. But she puts, with that lesson, she places another lesson. She says it's also her first lesson. What does her lesson? She says both of them must be taught at the same time. Let's see what other lesson she says. And even she says before a child can reason. That means from babyhood. What other lesson does she say? This is from child guidance. Hmm. Child guidance page 91. Another lesson which she says must be taught. She says, well may the mother inquire well may the mother inquire with deep anxiety as she looks upon children given to her care. What is the great aim and object of their education? It is to fit them. Now this is the object of the education. It is to fit them for life and its duties, to qualify them to take an honorable position in the world, to do a good, 
to do good, to benefit their fellow beings, to gain eventually the reward of the righteous. If so, she says that if this is your purpose of education for your children, she says if this, this is so, then the first lesson to be taught them is self-control. What is the first lesson? Self-control. She says obedience, but also yes, self-control as well. This has to be also taught the child. Self-control. Have you seen children throw a, a tantrum? Yeah. That's not self-control. And she says never, she says never, 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 when the child does that, submit. She says if you submit once, the child has now gained the victory and the child realizes. She says the next, the next battle you're gonna have with the child is gonna be much more severe. Yeah. She says the first time the child throws, throws the tantrum, she says do not submit. If you do, she says the conflict is going to become harder. And that child's mind, what will start developing is that whatever I want is law, it becomes law. Never, she says, do that. When the child starts, you teach the child self-control. This is the first lesson. Again, she says, one, of, one precious lesson which the mother will need to repeat again and again is that the child is not to rule. He is not the master, but her will and her wishes it ought to be supreme. Thus, she is teaching him self-control. How does she teach him self-control? That her wishes, that her will is to be supreme. When the child realizes that, automatically you're teaching the child self-control. Why? Because when they want something and mother says no, child realizes that's law. And what does it do as they keep growing? You teach them God as a law. And when God says, thou shalt not, because they have learned, thou shalt not, when mother says, thou shalt not, when father says, thou shalt not, when their minds already trained, mm -hmm. that when they read, thou shalt not, they realize, thou shalt not. It says, give them, now listen to what the prophet says, this is inspiration. Give them nothing for which they cry. Even if your tender heart desires ever so much to do this, so you might see the child crying and the heart might say, uh, let me just give, prophet says, God says, don't do it. Don't, even she says, your heart might be breaking, let me give the child. Don't do it when they start throwing a tantrum. She says, for if they gain the victory once by crying, they will expect to do it again. The second time the battle will be more vehement, meaning it will be more severe. So, Principle number one, she says, you must teach a child obedience before they can even reason, teach them to obey your word. Second thing, she says, teach them self-control. Teach them self-control. How do you do that? I'm asking, how do you teach them obedience? By example, how do you teach them self-control? Okay. Yes, you don't give in to their wishes, but they must learn. She says, this is how you teach them self-control. Blue words. He is not the master. The child must be taught he is not the master. But her world, who's the her? The mother's world. And her wishes ought to be supreme. The child must learn that mother's world, mother's wishes are supreme. <coughs> By teaching the child that, automatically you are teaching him self-control. Because when mother does speak, the child knows, okay, mother has said what she has said. Again, Child Guidance 92, amongst the first task of the mother is the restraining of the passion of passion in her little ones. Restrain the passion, she says, this is the first thing. She says, children should not be allowed to manifest anger. They should not be permitted to throw themselves upon the floor, striking and crying because something has been denied of them, which was not for their best good. I have been distressed as I've seen how many parents indulge their children in the display of angry passions. Mothers seem to look upon these outbursts of anger as something that must be endured and appear indifferent to the child's behavior. So what you're saying that some parents think that that's normal children behavior. Child throwing themselves on the floor and saying they want, they want, they want. She says that's not normal behavior. I'll show you a quotation next. She says that that evil spirit must be rebuked. <coughs> She says the child does not know what influence they're under. And she says, as mother, as father, rebuke that evil spirit. Restrain the child. 
She continues to say, but if, an ev but if an evil is permitted at once, it will be repeated, and its repetition will result in habit, so that the child's character will receive what? An evil mold. An evil mold. Now, this is the quotation I'm talking about. She says, the mother's work begins with the baby in her arms. I have often seen the little one throw itself and scream. If its world is crossed at in any way, thus is the time to rebuke the evil spirits. The enemy will try to control the minds of our children, but shall we allow him to mold them according to his will? These little ones cannot discern what spirit is influencing them. And it is the duty of the parents to exercise judgment and discretion for them. Their habits must be carefully watched. Evil tendencies ought to be restrained and the mind stimulated in favor of the right. The child should be encouraged in every effort to govern itself. So what does the prophet say when the child is throwing himself on the floor? She says they're under evil influence. It must be the child, she says the child doesn't fully understand. The child must be restrained and teach them not to do that. And what happens if the child gets its way when it throws itself on the floor? You, 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 are, you, are, you are strengthening what in the child? Selfishness. And what is the root of all evil? Selfishness. You are, making the, you are pushing the child further away from heaven. Further away from heaven. Now, inspiration teaches that before the child can even reason, there's a way in which you can teach the child. When they're still babies, in, you know, when, if you read to a baby, the baby cannot comprehend, right? If you take the Bible and you start reading, they cannot fully comprehend what's, what's, what's been said. But she says there is a beautiful way of teaching a child that's still within the mother's arms. Does someone, do you think the best, the prophet's gonna tell us what? Well, how do you think, you, how, how would you train a baby? How would you teach a baby to love God? Okay, yes, okay, by example, but the baby cannot fully see your example at that age. Song, song, song. This is from Child Guidance 93. She says, mothers should educate their babies in their arms, after correct principles and habits. Commence, com what does commence mean? Begin. Begin with songs of Bethlehem. In other words, songs about Jesus. Sing these songs. These soft tunes will have a quieting influence. Sing them, sing them, sing them, these subdued, in subdued, am I reading right? Sing them these subdued tunes in regard to Christ and his love. So how would you teach a baby a true song? Even while they're still in the womb. Do you know that, that, that singing, while the child's still in the womb, singing, singing. Now, mm, mm, mm. This is on this principle. She says, this is Child Guidance 213. She says, every child that is not carefully and prayerfully disciplined will be unhappy in this probationary time. If you want a child to be happy, what does she say must be involved in? Discipline. You know what is discipline? Correcting the child. If you want them, discipline them and tell them, mm -mm, this you cannot do. If happiness, she's saying the child's happiness consists in a parent disciplining their child. She continues, she says, in a black word, she says, this is a very, very great burden to be carried all through the life of a spoiled child. So if a child is spoiled, they can have no happiness. In trial, in disappointment, in temptation, he will follow his undisciplined, misdirected world. Children who are allowed to have their own way, they are not happy. They are not happy. They are not happy. They are not happy. Mm. This is also a powerful principle. Powerful, powerful principle. She says that a parent, this is what parents should never do in front of their children. Never should they do this. What does the prophet say? She says the family firm must be well organized. Together, father and mother must consider their responsibilities with a clear comprehension and undertake their task. There is to be no variance. The word variance means there should be no differences with father and mother. 
She says the father and mother should never, what does never mean? Sometimes, never, never not once, never in the, in the presence of their children criticize each other's plans and judgments. What should parents never do? Criticize each other in front of the children. Never, she says, do this. You're actually going to ruin the child. Again, so someone says, then what, what, what if we do disagree? Because she says, never disagree in front of the children. What if you're disagreeing? How, 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 what do we do? <laughs> Amen. She says, if parents do not agree, let them absent themselves from the presence of their children until an understanding can be arrived at. So even though they might disagree, she says, do not do it in front of the children. Go aside somewhere where the children cannot hear and then prayerfully consider the matter. Consider the matter. Now, the issue of obedience, the issue of obedience, this issue of obedience, we saw that one of the ways to bring about obedience is what? Example. 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 Now, there are some people that think that the best way to bring about obedience, the best way to do it, is through scolding. Do you know the prophet says that scolding cannot do the job? She says scolding actually does not work. And I want you to see what does God say to his prophet, Adventist Home 308. She says, let none imagine that harshness and severity are necessary to secure obedience. Some, some people think I have to be harsh and severe for the child to obey. Inspiration says, mm -mm. Now, she's going to give an example of two families. One family, no harshness, no severity. And there's another family with harshness and severity. Both of them got the results of obedience. Both got the results. One family never used harshness and severity. They got the results of obedience. Another family used that, and indeed, they also got obedience. But I want you to see what she says. One method was the right method. Other method, even though it got the results, but it was a wrong method. It says, I have seen the most efficient family govern government maintained without a harsh word or a look. No harshness, but she says, the most efficient family covenant. No harshness, no, 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 no um, harsh word or look. I have been in, another, in other families where commands were constantly given in an authoritative tone. And harsh rebukes and severe punishments were often administered. So let's see now what was that the result of that method, yes, there was obedience was happening, but what was the result? What did it cause? In the first case, now what was the first case? Which, which out of the family is the first case? The word that did not use harshness. It says in the first case, the children followed the course pursued by their parents and seldom spoke to one another in harsh tones. So what she is saying, that when the, the children would obey the parents, there was no harshness, and in the, as the, the parents gave the command, no harshness, she says there was no harshness amongst the children. Next one, red words. In the second, am I seeing right? In the second also, the parental example was imitated by children and cross words, fault fighting disputes were from morning till night. So when parents use harsh words, severe words, what, what is gonna hap what's going to happen? Yes, the child might obey. It's gonna, it leads to sin because then the child imitates you and then it's constantly amongst whether it's brother and sister within the home or whether it's their friends. They manifest the same thing. So in order to secure obedience, scolding is not necessary. Now, maybe let's look at one more quotation before I say that. Okay, th this is the issue of example. Hmm. Come on your Bible to Titus. Come on your Bible to Titus before we read that. Come on to Titus. 
I want us to see Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus 2. Now as we go into Titus 2, I want to read something from Adventist Home. 535. I'm going to just read this. Uh, Child Guidance 535. Titus 2. I want us to start in Titus chapter 2, verse 3. Titus 2, verse 3. It says here, now I want us to read what does the Bible say in Titus 2, verse 3. Onwards, we're going to read onwards. Now, can you remember concerning the child? Who would mold the child's character for good or for bad? Mother. In a large degree, the child's eternal destiny hangs in the hands of the mother in a large degree. We're not, we're, not, we're not ignoring the father. He also has a role to do. His role, yes, is to help with the duties of their child, to educate and train the child. Every father, based on the Bible, is to be a priest of his home. That means concerning religious education, largely, religious education depends also upon the father. And we're going to see that inspiration says there are certain things that a parent, before they have children, before mother and father say, okay, we're going to have a child, she says it's a sin for them to have children without first understanding these principles. She, she, inspiration says it's a sin. It is a sin. And she lists at least eight things, eight to nine things. She says that they must understand, they must become intelligent in regard to before they can have children. We look at those things. Now, before that, yes, I'm speaking about the mother. So, the, the child's destiny based on education largely depends in the hands of the mother. Largely, largely depends in her hands. Now, when you look at the world today, do you know that normally women today, they are seeking to, to do some great work. Either they want to be in, in something in Babylon, there want to be some corporate, climb up the ladder of Babylon, have some position in Babylon. They seek an education that can fit them to serve in Babylon. Do you know that that is actually coming from Satan? Publicly speaking, that when a woman marries, publicly speaking, and there's a child involved, her duty now becomes the home. What, that's, that's her position, her, the home life. And that's not degrading her. That's actually the highest, that, uh, highest duty, highest responsibility that God can place upon an individual as to train up children. That's Bible. I want us to see publicly. It says in Titus 2 verse 3, it says the aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as become with holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. This is talking about the aged woman, that they may teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, and I want you to see where must they be. Keepers at home. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Based on the Bible, where is a mother's position? Not in Babylon. Bible says in the home. That is her position. That is her position. That's actually God's original plan. That is God's original plan. Listen to what she says concerning God's plan. This is Child Guidance 535. It was God's plan for the members of the family to be associated in work, study, workshop, and recreation. What is God's plan? That the family would work together, they would study together, they would worship together. They would actually do everything together. This is God's original plan. Now, can city life accomplish this? Impossible. Because father in city life, he must go one place. Mother must go one place. Children go off to grandparents or they go off to some crash. That's not heaven's plan. It cannot be fulfilled in the city. It cannot be fulfilled in the city. Page 71 of the same book. Page 71 of Child Guidance. She says, 
The mother's work is such that it demands continual advancement in her own life in order that she might lead her children to a, to a higher and still higher attainments. So she says that if the mother is gonna be effective, there needs to be constant advancement in her own experience with God. But Satan, now I want you to see what Satan does. But Satan lays his plans to secure the souls of both parents and children. How does he do this? How does he lay his plans to secure both souls of parents and children? It says mothers are drawn away from the duties of home. How does he do this? He draws mothers away from their duties at home. And that, she says, will destroy both mother and child. Mothers are drawn away from their duties of home and the careful training of their little ones to the service of self and to the world. So when mother goes, there's no one to, pl to fill that, that void. No one to fill that void, and she says that the child becomes a good worldling. Obviously, God can redeem them, but why time is so short, there's no time for the child to grow up and then God to redeem them. Whatever remnants of time we have, parents, we should study these books, Child Guidance, Adventures to Home, and by God's great grace, implement them. This is the only way, this is the only way. Now, I want us to look at this and then we'll conclude. I want us to look at this. One of the best ways for mother, for father, she says in Child Guidance, page 69, she says, by prayer, you may gain an experience that will make your ministry for your children a perfect success. What will make a mother a father's work a success for their children? She says, it's prayer. Prayer. Now, I, I, I ask, Lord, how will this, how? I want you to see an example from the book Adventist Home, how prayer actually redeemed, I would say in a sense, redeemed the prophet's children. Let's see what happened. This is Adventist Home. 528, is this 528, 529? She says, when children will beg that they might go out, that they might go to this company or join that party of amusement, say to them, I cannot let you go. So in other words, she's saying if the children would ask, can I go certain place which you don't want them to go, which is wrong, she says, say to them, I cannot let you, I cannot let you go. Children sit down here and I will tell you why. I am, I am doing up the work for eternity and for God. God has given you to me and entrusted you to my care. I am standing in the place of God to you, my children. Therefore, I must watch you as one that must give an account in the day of God. Do you want your mother's name written in the books of heaven as one who failed to do a duty for her children or to her children? As one who let the enemy come in and preoccupy the ground that I ought to have occupied. Children, I am going to tell you that which is the right way. And then if you choose to turn away from your mother and go into the parts of wickedness, your mother will stand clear, but you will have to suffer your own sins. Then I have gone away. Now this is the prophet telling us in her experience when her children came. She says, then I have gone away and I have pleaded with God until, until the sun was up in the heavens the whole night long that the spell of the enemy might be broken and I have had the victory. I want you to see what the prophet is saying. When her children would come at times and would ask, can they go somewhere which the prophet knows, mm -mm, this is not what heaven approves. She would speak to them candidly and explain to them, no, I cannot let you go. And then afterwards she would go into a closet and she said she would plead with God the whole night that the spell might be broken. Friends, this is laboring for the children. She continues, she says, now she says she would labor all night until the victory was gained. She says, although it cost me a night's labor, what is she saying that, I praise, that she was praying and doing? It was laboring for children. Someone says, does that laboring? Yes, that's laboring. To pray the entire night pleading with God for those children, you are laboring for their salvation. Now friends, I'm saying time is so short. If you have a child and we are reading this and you can see, man, I'm trying to teach these children, but it seems like they're not getting it. There's something that can help you. Labor for their child the entire night pleading with God. 
Someone says, I cannot do that. Friends, and you're, that means you're not serious. How dare you have a child and you're unwilling to plead with God for their salvation? It says, although it cost me a night's labor, yet I felt richly paid when my children would hang about my necks and, necks and say, oh mother, we are so glad that you did not let us go when we wanted to. Now we see, now we see that it would have been wrong. Parents, this is the way you must work as though you meant it. You must make it a business of this, you must make it a business of the work if you expect to save your children in the kingdom of God. Can you see, she would see the result. Next day the children would come and they would come and hang about her and say, mother, you are right, we were wrong. Can you see God was able to do what she could not do? She tried and reasoned with them, but they could not, they, they, their minds could not see it. And she would plead the entire night and next day they would see it. Mother, you are right. Another way to labor parents is to constantly pray, constantly pray for the children, constantly pray. Child guidance page 96, child guidance page 96. Oh, sorry, 69, 69. Now, let's close on this point. Hmm. Sixty-nine again, child guidance. So one thing she says you must pray, but what's another thing a mother should constantly feel a need of? She says the mother should feel a need of the Holy Spirit's guidance. Then through the grace of Christ, she can be wise, gentle, and a loving teacher of her children. So constantly a parent feeling their need for the Spirit's guidance because the Spirit can do what our feeble efforts would never do. As a parent, you won't be able to do. Again, she says, Adventist Psalm 323, when Christ is in the heart, he is brought into the family. The father and mother feel the importance of living in obedience to the Holy Spirit so that heavenly angels who minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation will minister to them as teachers in the home. So what she is saying is that if you want the, the, the angels to come within your home, she says, then Christ must be in the heart. If you want the effect of the Holy Spirit to work on the hearts of your children, she says Christ must first be in your own heart. And then she says, black watch, she says, in the home it is possible to have a little church which will honor and glorify the Redeemer. So within the home, the children should actually come to a place where they learn to respect the hour of worship. Like whenever there's family worship, every home should have family worship. When you're gathered as a family, the children must be taught to reverence their time. In the, in the sense that they cannot start making noise, whenever the Bible is open, they must be taught that now is not the time to speak and make a noise, unless obviously they're participating in the worship. By you teaching them in the home to reverence the hour of worship, when they come to church, they will understand to reverence, not to make a noise, to be quiet. Why certain children cannot be ruled, they cannot, parents cannot govern them in the church because they have not taught them worship at home. It's difficult, they don't, they don't do it. So when they come to church, child doesn't understand and must be reverent. And the child, parent says, keep quiet. And the child says, why must I keep quiet? Not taught them. But where it begins, it must start within the home. Must start within the home. Now I conclude on this one, Education 22. She says, as the highest preparation for your work. So she says, this is the highest preparation as a parent. Highest preparation. She says, I point you to the words the life, the methods of the prince of teachers. Who was that? Jesus. So she says, if the highest, this is the highest preparation for your work. She says, study the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Study his life. I bid you consider Jesus. Yes, your true ideal. Behold it, dwell upon it, until the spirit of the divine teacher shall take possession of your heart and life. So how long should we dwell upon Jesus until he takes possession of the heart and life? Reflecting as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, you will be transformed into the same image. This is the secret of power over your pupils. Reflect him, reflect Jesus. 
So if you're going to be successful within your home, she says, if you're going to be successful as a parent, she says, reflect Jesus. That's precept. Um, example. Example. By reflecting Jesus, when you do speak of Jesus, the child's heart will be open to receive it. They'll be open to receive it. Let us conclude. In this. Coming to Isaiah 38. Isaiah chapter 38. Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38 verse 1. God speaking through his prophet to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah's probation is about to close. What does God say to Hezekiah as his probation is about to close? It says, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt surely die and not live. What is in God's mind when a man's probation is about to close? Is his house. That's one of the things uppermost in God's mind. God could have said anything to Hezekiah, but when he sends Isaiah, he says, Isaiah, make sure that when you tell him he's going to die, tell him I said he must set his house in order. So if probation is about to close for the church, plus minors, crisis, America is going to collapse, what do you think is in God's mind for the church? Set your house in order. Why was Abraham a friend of God? Because that's the whole purpose of the Bible, is to develop a friendship. Jesus says, these things I have said unto you. And he says, I have spoken openly to you because you are my friends. The whole purpose of the Bible is to bring us into a friendship with God. And Abraham was a friend of God. The Bible says he was a friend. I want you to see what did Abraham do that God called him a friend. Come with me to Genesis chapter 19. We conclude here. Genesis 19. Genesis chapter 19. What did Abraham do? Did I say Genesis 19? Genesis 18 verse 19. Genesis 18 verse 19. It says in Genesis 18, verse 19, it says, For I know him, God speaking about Abraham, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, and the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken. What did God say about Abraham? that he's going to command his children and his household after him. And do you, know, do, you know, do you know the context of this is that God was sending angels to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy and to see if this place is wickedness and destroy it. And God asked the question, shall I hide this thing from Abraham? He asked, shall I hide it from Abraham? And God says, mm -mm, I cannot do it. I cannot, and God explained to Abraham exactly. But the, 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 the reason why it says, I know Abraham, that Abraham was faithful. He's going to command his children and his household after him. If we want to know the secrets of the Lord, we have to be faithful within our homes. Those who are unfaithful in their homes are not going to get the secrets of the Lord. We must be faithful friends. Now, what we share is specifically for parents. Even if you are not a parent, in some degree, there's nieces, there's nephews, there's some, someone younger that might look up to you. And if you have influence over them, then these are some of the principles that can be implemented. If you have children you are teaching, that these principles adopted in the life and then obviously taught to those who are under you. And I'm saying even this principle where Sister White prayed the entire night, do you know that if you're going to be successful in ministry as well, whatever ministry God has called you to, that's one thing you have to do. To spend some time, even if it's by yourself, Spend the entire night communicating with God, pleading for those people you're laboring for, or whether it's your family. I'm saying true success in the work of God is not our talent. It's not how much we know. True success, God brings true success. But the way he does it, we see it in the life of Jesus. Jesus was constantly in communion with heaven. Sometimes he would labor the entire day, and then he would come on the mountains and he would speak with God the entire night. This gave success to the ministry of Jesus. And if we're going to have success, we must spend sometimes entire nights in prayer.
Now, God wants us to do it every night, but wherever God impresses the heart, we should spend that time in communication with him. If there's a family crisis within the home, you can see things are not looking too well within family, husband, wife, children, then that should be a call to prayer. Father, as the head of the home, you should see it and say, okay, I'm gonna plead, I'm gonna plead to heaven for my family. This is what should be done, friends. This is what should be done. Let us close. This November 25th, 2022, it says Pope Francis, is aligning the United Nations 2030 agenda with the Vatican's Laudato Si goal for the World Youth Day 2023. So the Pope is aligning something that's taking place with the United Nations and obviously the goal, the Laudato Si goal for 2023. What is the Laudato Si goal? I want us to see, before we look at the goal, let's just read this article. It says a remarkable phenomenon is taking place in today's political and religious world. There's an alignment taking place what, in which the political and religious leaders are uniting to promote the very same message. So it's saying that the church and the state are uniting to promote the same thing. The world is uniting under Pope Francis's leadership to save the planet. Even as sin and lawlessness continue to spread at an alarming rate, the Pope's plan for Youth Day 2023 is to combine the United Nations 2030 agenda with Laudato Si in an effort to bring about or to bring the world together around a single new sustainable economy based on papal dogma. So what it's saying is that there's a movement within the Roman Catholic Church organization to push a, an eco economy that is based upon climate, but this economy is, finds its, its root in La Dato C for the economy. So it's an economy that's gonna help the climate, but it's basically, it finds its root in La Dato C as the solution for climate. And we know what is the solution Sunday. Now, this is the original article now, this is the original article. It says it is our mission this, this um, Laudato Si goal for 2023, it is our mission to build JMJ Lisbon 2023 upon the sustainability goals adapted globally. The Laudato Si goal put forward by the Vatican as well as the United Nations 2030 agenda. So does the United Nations also have a goal to bring about some sort of economy to help the world? I mean, the. Um, the climate, yes. La Dato C goal also has an economy to help the world. So both of them are trying to combine to push this thing about or bring this thing about. Then it says, yeah, this is from Advent Messenger. It says, Dias Monet's register report that Sunday race may be ready to emerge. This is November 21st, 2022. So you can see there's an agitation with Sunday. An agitation with Sunday. This year was November 29, 2022. It says Adventists, you join Roman Catholics, Evangelics, Muslims, and Jews in, 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 in ecumenical environmentalism. So unfortunately, as this great thing to actually preserve the environment, which obviously to preserve the environment is no sin. But when something good is preserved with an apostate system, then it becomes evil. Do you know in Ellen White's time, the temperance movement was united with Sunday. Temperance is a good thing. But she says that because temperance is united with the Sunday movement, she says it makes it even more dangerous. Because a person will avoid the poison when they see it. But when you take poison and you put it in something good, someone can pick it up and drink it unknowingly. So even though obviously preserving the environment is not a sin, but there's an agenda behind it. The agenda is to enforce a Sunday law, which is the mark of the peace, and actually remove our religious liberty. So this movement, actually no Adventists should unite with no ecumenical movement. No ecumenical movement. I'm gonna stop here. Let us pray. We are hoping that the book Child Guidance for those who are parents will be picked up, the book Adventist Home, and the book Adventist Home. Let us pray, let us reverently kneel.
Loving Father, we just come before you, Lord, and yeah, we want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the testimonies. And Father, I just pray that as we look briefly at some of these principles, that you'll please, Lord, just create within the heart of every parent a desire to pick up these books, to study into them. And I also pray that as you reveal these principles to each family, each parent, that you'd give them the strength, Lord, to implement what they are learning. And the promise is that when these principles are received and put into practice, we are told that evil will not attract the child. Evil will have no power at all. Truly, Lord, that if we train up the child in the way he should go, when he is old, he will not depart. Please, Lord, the reason why many children are departing is that parents are not training their children. It's a false education and they see the child departing and they think that you have failed on your promise. Lord, your word cannot fail. If you say that evil will not attract the child, indeed evil will not do it, if the principles are implemented. But Lord, we know there's redemption with you, and we know there's not just redemption, there's plenteous redemption. That even where parents have failed, miserably failed, there's still hope if they would come to Jesus in repentance. Father, we just pray for those children who are, not, who are old, old now, Parents who might have children and they realize these principles now and wish they could have implemented them. We pray for those children who are old in which they have no more influence as they had before, who are now wayward. We ask that you bring them back to the faith. Have mercy, Lord. And even the parents that have viewed this, may they see that principle of pleading for their children throughout the night, pleading that the spell of Satan will be broken. For prayer can do what no human effort can do. You can break the spell of Satan. Please, Father, I just pray you would bless us. Be with us. And even if there's, no, there's people, that we have no children, but there are younger people whom we would come in contact with. As Elijah, he had no children, but he had Elisha to train. So, Father, I just pray that even these principles would be adopted by those who might not have children, but would have younger people, whether niece, nephews, to teach these things that we have learned, help them to implement them in their life and to teach them. Thank you so much, Father, for your love. Thank you for your kindness and your goodness towards us. Please bless us and prepare us, Father, for the close of human probation. It's not a fantasy, it's a reality. Jesus is about to come. Please, may you help us to get ready to meet him in peace. And we are told that every man that has this hope, the hope of the second coming of Jesus, he purifies himself, even as Jesus is pure. Please, Lord, may the work of purification take place within our hearts, not just on this day, but every day of the week. We become more and more like our Savior. We love you, Father, and we pray these mercies humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Someday the silver cord will break, and I know more as now shall sing but all the joy when i shall wake within the palace of the king and i shall see him face to face and tell the story